Good evening. The story I'm about to tell you takes place in the age of wonder. My personal age of wonder started when I was about eight or nine years old, and I started asking questions about the world around me. And one person to guide me in this was my grandfather, Opa. Now, Opa was not an old-fashioned man at all. He was the one who introduced me to the computer. And he loved building and creating things. And one day, he took me to this very museum, Tyler's Museum in Harlem, the city where I grew up. And he parked his car outside on the Sparne, and we entered this building through the gate with the statues, and we went into the first room. The first room was full of fossils, and at the time, I really liked dinosaurs. So I was amazed to see the mammoth skull in one corner and the skeleton of an ancient bear in another. But my opa had more in store for me. He took me to the oval room. And this room was full of machines, contraptions, gizmos, broken things that need fixing. And then opa showed me this. A planetarium. And Opa started explaining what it was. He said, look, this brass ball, this is our sun. And the sun is a star, just like the ones we see at night. And these little marbles that go around it, they are planets. And there's four big ones outside and four little ones inside. And this one, this little marble, this is the Earth. It's our own planet. We are standing on it right now. Now, I was amazed. My head filled with questions. Opa, how can the sun be a star? It's much bigger than the stars. And why are those planets actually bigger than the Earth? I didn't like that at all. Why, if we live on a ball, are the people on the bottom not falling off? And Opa could, of course, answer most of these questions, but some of them, even Opa, did not know the answer to. Opa, are these the only planets that exist? Now, when this planetarium was made, more than 200 years ago, they were. 20 years ago, when I went to this museum with my Opa, they were still the only eight planets that we knew in the universe. It's only 20 years ago. By now, things have changed. Ten years later, I finished my education at the Stedelijk Gymnasium in Haarlem, right here. And I went on an adventure. I went to South America to teach in a jungle village called Wauna, deep in the jungle of Guyana. And there, the school children, like me at their age, asked me lots of questions. And every question led to a different question. And a lot of questions were about the sky at night, because it looked something like this. This was virtually our only entertainment. There was no electricity, which means that you could look at the stars very well. And when I was sitting on my balcony at night, myself, like anybody of you who has ever seen a sky like this, I wondered the same question, the big question that we always ask ourselves. Are we alone? Could it be that somewhere among those white dots, there would be one of them, that hosts a planet on which life abides. And intuitively, we all know the answer. Why, of course. We can't be the only ones in the universe. It's so big. Or, as George Carlin puts it, if it is true that our species is alone in the universe, then I'd have to say the universe aimed rather low and settled for very little. And it wasn't until I became an astronomer and started asking questions for a living that I discovered that this question is not anymore answered only by science fiction. 
but science itself is trying to answer it. And there's only one definitive answer that science can give, which is finding a counterexample. Finding life in the universe would mean that the answer to the question whether we are alone is no. But how do we find it? Life may adapt different forms, which we won't know how to recognize. And if you can't recognize anything, you won't realize that you found it. So we need, in order to find life, to have a benchmark, an example. And the only example that we know of life that works takes place here on Earth. So actually, what we are doing in order to find life, we are looking for ourselves. We're looking for a copy of the Earth. Now, scientists also always need some criteria to define life by. And our ancestors already had these. Our ancestors noticed that the world around them, the living things in the world, relied on or consisted of four basic elements. Earth, fire, water and air. Now, these are still the basic elements that we define life by. Let me explain you why. First, the first two elements. First of all, life needs a source of energy, fire. Sources of energy are abundant in the universe, the stars. Star is a very stable energy source that can burn for billions of years. The only problem is that it is a little bit hot on the surface of a star. So life, in order to flourish, needs solid ground. It needs a planet, Earth. So we are looking for a planet around a star, just like you see here. That is the first ingredient. Now, how do we find the planet? Well, look at these stars and notice the one in the middle. When astronomers used ever better telescopes to gaze at the stars, they noticed that sometimes a star would become just a little bit fainter. And then it would brighten up again. Now, this could be anything. It could be a bird flying by. But some of these stars showed that this happened periodically, with the same cadence, over and over. So that's when they figured that what actually was going on, and I take as an example our own sun. If we would be gazing at our sun, like I am gazing at the planetarium right now, exactly in our line of sight aligned with the orbital plane of the planets, then once every year, we would see the Earth passing in front of the Sun. And temporarily, we would receive less light from the Sun. Of course, I exaggerated here, yet that amount, because the Earth is so tiny. So you need a good telescope. If this happens more than once, and if it happens periodically with the same cadence, you know you're dealing with a planet. And this is just one method to find planets outside our solar system, but it is the most prolific one. This is a map of the sky. The way it works, it's the same as a map of the Earth, but looking up instead of down. You see the plane of the Milky Way in the middle that you sometimes see across the sky. Now this were the known exoplanets, as we call them, extrasolar planets, in 95. None. But then they found the first one. And as the years progressed, more white dots appeared. In fact, since the discovery of the first exoplanet, the increase in the discoveries has been exponential. And right now, 20 years after the date that I was here with my grandfather, we know a hundred times more planets than just these eight. 
If you notice the little white area there in the top left of the screen, that's crowded with planners. This is the area of the sky that the satellite Kepler, with a telescope on board, had been looking at for four years, until, sadly, it perished last week. But Kepler has given us a lot of planets, and it was just staring at this patch of the sky continuously. Imagine if we could look at the whole sky like that. This whole screen would have been white with planets by now. And then realize this would only be the tip of the iceberg, because we, we are only seeing those planets that are passing in front of their stars. There could be other systems where the planets go around like this. We'd never see them. So we can make estimates of what we don't see. And last year, people have come up with a number. They have dared to come up with a number. The next time you look at the sky at night, realize that every star you see has at least one planet orbiting it give or take. That's quite amazing. Here's something else. These are the systems that we found multiple planets around. So every wiggling dot here represents a planetarium just like this one. Now, for, firstly, we thought that every planet system must look like our solar system, for big planets, for small ones. But nature fools us. There can be solar systems with a planet ten times as big as Jupiter orbiting inside the orbit of the Earth. So there's multiple planet systems possible. We have already started finding them. But how do we detect life on them? This brings me to the third element of life. All life forms on Earth, in some way, are consist of or make use of liquid water. In fact, water is abundant in the universe. So that's not the problem. The problem is the liquid part. If water is hotter than 100 degrees, it evaporates. And if it's colder than zero, it freezes out. And given the temperature of a star, in this case our sun, there's only a very narrow area around it where water can be liquid. Closer in, it will evaporate. Further out, it will freeze. So in between is a zone that planet hunters call the Goldilocks zone, after the fairy tale. Goldilocks comes into the bear's house, sees three bowls of porridge, one is too hot, one is too cold, and one has exactly the right temperature. So we're looking for an Earth-like planet around the star in the Goldilocks zone. But water itself may be a condition for life. It does not necessarily produce life. If I run a bath and leave it for a million years, not much will happen to the bath. So we need a sign of life. We need something to indicate that life is definitely there. And this, in the case of the Earth, is air or oxygen. When the Earth started out, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. But since life initiated on the Earth, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere increased until it, it reached a stable level of one-fifth of the atmosphere. If life would disappear from Earth, so would the oxygen from the atmosphere. Okay, so we've got our biomarker, as we call it, the sign of life. Could we detect that? Well, in principle, yeah, but it is tricky. Let's consider again this planet passing in front of the star. Now, if we zoom in during the transit, at the edges of the planet, some of the sunlight will shine through 
the atmosphere. If the atmosphere contains O2, oxygen, then the light that sifts through it will, in some colors, be ab absorbed by the oxygen. In other words, oxygen will leave a signature in this light, a signature that we can recognize. So we have our method. It's easy. The only problem is contrast. This drawing is very nice, but in reality, this happens very far away. In our telescope, this will only be one pixel. So we need to be able to tell apart the light from the planet from the light of the star. This bike light has to battle against a thousand football stadiums. We need a good telescope. With the ones we have now, we can barely pull it off. We've started doing so, but oxygen in an Earth-like planet is still very, very challenging. But we're building new telescopes with bigger mirrors. And this one on the right is the extremely large telescope, will be 20 times larger in terms of area than any telescope built before. Now, I'm not promising you that this one will definitely put it off. But nature may yet surprise us, and we're getting close. Now, to finish, why? Why are we doing this? Well, just look at this picture. This is a picture that was taken in 1990 by a spacecraft named Voyager 1. It was sent into outer space to explore. And as it was exiting the solar system, it was just past Pluto. Carl Sagan, the great astronomer, told it to turn around one more time and look back. And it took this lousy picture. Because <laughs> the stripes you see on this image are not what you meant to be looking at. They're just stray sunlight. They're an artifact. The subject of the picture is this single dot. He called it a pale blue dot. Oh, this is us. This is the Earth. Everything you know, everybody you will ever know, every book you have ever read was written on this pale blue dot. Makes you feel kind of small, huh? Well, lately, I've added another thought when I'm looking at this picture. Because we, on our pale blue dot, are looking back into the universe. And every time I see a sky like this, I know that around one of those dots may be a yet even smaller dot on which an entire civilization like ours thrives. For 10,000 years, we have stared at skies like this. Only the last 20 of them, we know that more planets like ours exist. I hope that one day I will be a grandfather myself and take my grandchild to this very museum, which will be filled with planetaria like this one. And I'll be able to tell him or her that on this little marble, other life exists. And then the questions can start. We are truly living in an age of wonder, and I'm happy to live it. Thank you very much. <laughs>